For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is independent investigative journalist and author, Ruth Hopkins, here to discuss her book titled, The Misery Merchants, Life and Death in a Private South African Prison. From 2012 to 2020, you investigated allegations of abuse at the Mangawun Correctional Center in Bloemfontein, following interviews with inmates, guards, as well as multiple government and G4S sources. So can you briefly tell us more on what were some of the shocking incidents you came to know were happening in the prison? Yeah, um, I started in 2012 while I was working for the Witz Justice Project based at Witz University in Johannesburg. Uh, and that was a, a collective of investigative journalists who looked at the criminal justice system. And so prisoners would write to us throughout the, the country from various prisons. And I noticed that there were a lot of letters from uh, Mangong prison. So I went there to investigate actually a case of wrongful conviction. And I thought, you know what, I'll just bring all those other letters and talk to these prisoners. And I did. And they started telling me about widespread use of electroshocking as a, a form of torture. Uh, they started telling me about how the prison was using antipsychotic drugs as a form of crowd control. And I also started hearing about uh, suspicious deaths happening uh, in the prison. And so I, that that became the focus of my investigation. I started looking into that. And then in 2013, a strike broke out at the prison. Uh, and so all the guards were either on strike or dismissed. And so they were much easier to access and, and more willing to talk. So I started talking to guards and they basically corroborated all my findings. And then I started talking to DCS officials as well. And in October 2013, I first uh, broke the story of electroshocking uh, and forced injections with antipsychotic drugs. And it really is one of the most violent prisons in South Africa. And talking about um, forced injections, can you tell us more on that? Well, yeah, according to South African law, you can uh, forcibly inject uh, a person with antipsychotic drugs. However, a whole procedure then needs to be followed. Uh, a doctor needs to be informed, a physician, uh, the head of prison should have been informed. There should have been a whole paper trail. Uh, and, and also that a paper trail that proved that this person was a danger to either himself or his environment. Uh, and that procedure wasn't followed at all. I learned that even guards, even non-medical staff were using the injections as a form of crowd control. And the medication that was used varied from etamine, for example, which is a, a very heavy tranquilizer and antipsychotic drug, Rispadal, um, Clopixol Depot. These are all medications used for people who have really serious mental health issues. And, and some of these prisoners didn't. They were just being difficult or complaining or being vocal. And these injections in the prison were known as making the prisoners look like zombies or robots because it would make them completely um, out of it uh, and they would sleep for hours and they would forget it would it would affect their memory so it was used as a, a basically as a cheap form of uh, crowd control and race-based inequality is one of the things that led Dan Mbelwani, a warder at Mangaung Prison, to start initiating relationships with prisoners. So can you tell us more on this? Yeah, I mean, that that is something that I'm, I'm currently, again, investigating a Mangaung Prison, and it's something I heard that is still an issue, even though guards have uh, complained about this from, from the very early days, 20, well, the very early days of my investigation, 2012, 2013. Uh, yeah, and that is that there is a race inequality. Uh, so a Mangaung Prison is a maximum security prison, so pretty uh, serious inmates go there com convicted of, of of the most serious crimes and it can be a really violent chaotic prison also because of the way it's it's run uh, and so what you see uh, in terms of race is that mainly the black employees are put into the dangerous positions as guards uh, in the street and 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 the regular guards 
um they, they don't have a lot of they're not armed you know and so they they very regularly get stabbed get taken hostage uh the, even some cases of female guards getting raped um and the the company has done nothing to uh acknowledge this the, acknowledge the problem or to provide counseling and what you see is that a lot of the white employees end up in like safe office jobs um, removed from these problematic uh, prisoners. Um, and, and G4S as a company, G4S is um, the biggest private security provider in the world. Uh, and in 2007 already, War on Want uh, published a report about how G4S guards get treated in South Africa, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, I think. Uh, anyways, already in 2007, G4S in South Africa had a whites only toilet and was using very derogatory words to refer to uh, to black black workers. So it's 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 not an isolated incident in G4S in in the prison. And briefly tell us more about how the state is milked because of contractual obligations not being fulfilled. Yeah, the, the state is indeed milked. It's an incredibly expensive prison contract. Um, and actually, G4S is, is just one of five shareholders. There are five shareholders that go behind this prison contract. Fakila Mangaung, Ten Alliance Mangaung, Equasi Community Trust, Old Mutual, and G4S. That are the five shareholders. Um, and it cost 45 million rand a month for the for the South African government to run this prison. And uh, the prison contract at the because this prison opened its doors in 2000. And so the prison contract was signed in 1999 and it was drafted by Fricky Fenter, who then um, became the first. So he went from DCS to G4S. He became the first prison uh, director. And he drafted the contract in very favorable terms for the shareholders. And already in 2002, this contract turned out to be completely uh, unaffordable for the South African state. So the National Treasury uh, investigated this contract, looked at it, analyzed the contract and concluded uh, this contract is completely not renegotiable. It's completely inflexible. It's drafted uh, in terms that are favorable to the shareholders, but not to the South African state. So the South African government uh, could not change anything about this contract. And now the contract has been terminated and it most probably will also lead to uh, an obligation for the South African government to pay the capital costs of this uh, prison contract, in, which is basically, in other words, crippling debt. So yes, the South African state has definitely been milked for, for this contract. And Ruth, you also stated that whistleblowers form an invaluable part of your work and professional success, and that without them, you would have never broken stories. So do you think enough is done in the country when it comes to the protection of whistleblowers? <laughs> Most definitely not. Um, you're right. Whistleblowers are incredibly important um, in my work. In my book, there are several whistleblowers who play such an important role. One of them, I devote a whole chapter to him, Tatolo Sedlai. He used to be a DCS controller uh, stationed at Mangaung Prison, uh, and he did his job. He reported on all these irregularities, human rights violations, corruption. He reported actually on the forced injections, on the electroshocking. And what happened to him? What did DCS do? The government, they investigated him and they reported him to the police and they transferred him because uh, he wrote this report in 2009, I think. He leaked that report to me. At the time, the government did nothing to follow up on this. They they didn't hold the company accountable. They didn't address these very serious issues that he exposed. No, they they investigated him, uh, reported him to reported him for inciting riots, which he never did, and basically made his life a hell. So no, whistleblowers are not treated favorably, especially not in the correctional sector in in South Africa. And can you briefly talk to us more on what you uncovered regarding what happened to Isaac Nelani in the dark room on May 18th, 2005? Yeah, um, uh, Isaac Nelani uh, is another case that I devote a whole chapter to in my book, Misery Merchants. And 
I was just telling you how in 2012, I started interviewing prisoners in Mangong prison. And then his case was already mentioned. They said, look at the case of Isaac Nalani. And I started looking into, into his case. Um, and it's, it's a very sinister, dark case. And I, I actually have a long list of other prisoners who possibly were ended their life in a similar way, but I was never able to fully corroborate it. I was able to fully corroborate Isaac Nalani's death and he was tortured to death. So it was 2005 and he was in uh, Broadway in the unit uh, where uh, Bester was also kept. If I remember correctly, I think he was three doors down. He was in cell 30, no, he was one door down. He was in cell 34, Bester was in cell 35. Um, and this was uh, designed, uh, G4S claims, as a suicide prevention cell. And it was a cell where, where inmates would be brought to cool down. So the cell was kept intentionally with a low temperature. So inmates could, could cool down if they were aggressive or in any other way kind of disorderly. Um, and Isaac Nalani was in, broad, in the Broadway unit complained uh, he was HIV positive he complained about being cold it was winter he wanted another blanket that ended up in a verbal fight with the G4S guard then the EST the emergency security team was called um, and they first of all put Isaac Nalani under a cold shower um, he was then wet and then they took him to cell 34 and started electroshocking him beating him um, and I, I've spoken to eyewitnesses who all confirmed this. They were they were at the time uh, in cells that gave a view of cell 34, and they they confirmed that he was uh, basically tortured to death. Um, I also I accessed the pathologist report, and the pathologist um, who's called Jean Book basically concluded this is a suspicious death because what G4S did. They claimed, oh, um, Isaac Nalani committed suicide. And Jean Book, the pathologist, said, no, he didn't, uh, because he has bruising to the back of his heart. Now, bruising to the back of your heart, you can only get if blunt force trauma is applied to the heart. It's a very, very serious, lethal injury. Uh, and people uh, get bruising to the heart when they fall off a building or when something really serious happened. And... Eyewitnesses claim that Isaac Nalani was kicked and assaulted really badly. So that's probably where the bruising to the heart arose. And, and that's why the pathologist concluded this is a suspicious death because he had this really serious injury. Yeah, so, so G4S, uh, after uh, Isaac Nalani was tortured to death, um, eyewitnesses claim that G4S managers appeared and they repositioned the body to make it look like a suicide. Um, and this is also an interesting case if you look at the Bester case, because it's very similar. You know, Bester tried to make it look like a suicide. And uh, in, in the case of Isaac Nalani, you can also see that the SAPS is, is deeply involved and complicit because they came and they did nothing and they, they helped um, the company cover up. Um, and you can also, in this case, sadly see that DCS was also uh, aware of this pathologist report, was aware of what happened and also did absolutely nothing. Um, so, yeah, it's a very dark, sinister case of a cover up of a man who was tortured to death um, and G4S tried to make it look like a suicide. And lastly, Ruth, while we are on the Besta issue, in 2022, a body was found in Tabo Besta's prison cell used as a decoy for Besta's death. And it is also alleged that Besta paid off an ex-G4S official to help him escape prison. So do you think government should continue awarding profitable contracts to multinational enterprises that are mostly focused on their share price and have very little concern for the humanity of the people they interact with? Absolutely not. I mean, that's also a broader question. That's not just a South African issue that, you know, G4S is a global private security provider, runs prisons in the UK, in Australia, ran prisons in the US, and it has a similar track record in those countries. 
And the problem here is also, if you look at the Bester escape, several G4S guards and managers were directly involved. They were paid and they helped Bester escape. However, at the level of directors, they, they possibly weren't directly involved, but they, they knew what had happened. Their incentive to cover all of this up was the prison contract, was the fact that they didn't want the company to be fined, whatever the fine is. Their uh, incentive to cover up this escape, because I'm sure they knew from a very, basically from, from the 3rd of March, 2022, they knew what happened. Also from the investigation I've I've been doing, I've been speaking to eyewitnesses uh, on the guard side and on the inmate side. Management directors, they knew, and they covered up because of a financial incentive. And that, I think, in my view, is really wrong, is to, uh, if you attach a financial incentive to the incarceration of citizens, of people, then you, in fact, create a financial incentive to keep crime rates high and to cover up any crime that's been going on in the prison. Because what's the consequence? A financial fine, a penalty. And so I think that attaching profit to the incarceration of individuals in itself is deeply, deeply flawed deeply problematic, and we shouldn't allow that anywhere in the world. And I think, sadly, Mangaung Prison and the Besta Escape is like a perfect case study of, of why the for-profit incarceration is such a bad idea. That was Ruth Hopkins speaking to Krimer Media's polity about the misery merchants.